Greetings, I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. I'm recording this in December of 2019, and it occurs to me that 19 years ago in December of 2000 was when I recorded my very first show of Looking Up. And that 19 years is going to come into play in the topic tonight. And the topic is called Looking at Eclipses, which is kind of a little bit of a pun if you think about eclipses that, at least in a total solar eclipse, you're not supposed to look at it at all. Or you could go blind unless you're wearing the right kind of protective eye gear or using something like... <clears throat> a little pinhole in a cardboard and then another card you you stand with your back to the sun and it brings the image through that little pinhole onto a paper or whatever you're looking at actually and also in the moment of totality if you are in the path of totality of an eclipse you can look at the sun because all that's showing then is just the corona around it but I don't recommend doing that unless you really know what you're doing. So I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself, so I have to back up to the very beginning and say, let's talk about what is an eclipse. And I, I went back in my notes, and I, I saw that I had done a show all about eclipses back in 2007. So I guess we're kind of due for one now, 12 years later. So the word origin of eclipse comes from a word that means to abandon. So in an eclipse, it will appear as if the regular light of the sun or the reflected sunlight from the moon abandons us. And there's also the word we use occulting or occultation. It's spelled like occult, meaning um, kind of secret, like the Masonic's uh, rules and books and all would be considered secret, the occult. Uh, or we talk about things like, um, you know, magic and witchcraft and things like that. But that's probably because those people had to remain hidden or the principles upon which they practiced their craft were hidden from the regular public. But occult means to hide. and. When we have an eclipse, what really is going on is a nearly perfect alignment between the sun, the moon, and the earth. And such an alignment like that has a fancy word, I call it a $5 word, syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. And if you play Scrabble, I don't know if there's enough Ys in Scrabble, but if you ever got all six of those letters, I bet it would add up to a pretty good word score. So that's a great word. In fact, one of my ex-boyfriends, who's still a friend, has named one of the albums of his band, was called Syzygy, because he likes that word so much. And when we think about how is it possible that the moon, from our viewpoint on Earth, could totally block out the sun. And that's partly due to the physics, because the Earth's distance from the sun is 400 times greater than the moon's distance from Earth, while the size of the sun, from our standpoint, is 400 times bigger than the size of the moon. I think that's right. I'm going to have to look at my notes. But it's something like that. 400 is the number that's involved. And I hope I stated that correctly. Hmm. Anyway, when we have a new moon, a new moon is when the sun and the moon are at the same degree of the zodiac. That's right, the sun's diameter, diameter size. 400 times the Earth's size. Yeah, I remembered that right. Yay! Okay, so, you know, we're on a slightly oval 
elliptical orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And the Moon's orbit around the Earth is also slightly elliptical. And what that can mean is that sometimes the Moon is closer to Earth or farther from the Earth. So if it's at its farthest point called apogee, it looks smaller. And if it's at its closest point called perigee, it looks bigger. So that business about the 400 times difference in size and that comes into play. Because if what's happening when the faster moon, because it orbits Earth, comes between Earth and the Sun, but even the moon is at its farther point from us, it might not be able to block out the whole Sun's disk from our viewpoint. So what you have then is a special kind of eclipse, not a total, but called an annular. And that comes from the word like annularis or something like that, that means ring. It's not the same word as annual. So we do have eclipses every year, but they're not the same time every year. So they're not kind of an annual event. Annular is different. So a solar eclipse when the moon is eclipsing the sun or blocking the sun and the sun is abandoning us, sometimes it will be a partial solar eclipse. And that might mean that the moon is not blocking out the whole face of the sun or it gets right between the earth and the sun, but it's not big enough to block out the whole sun. So only when conditions are just right is that moon going to block out the totality of the sun. In a lunar eclipse, which occurs at a full moon, you're going to have the Earth casting a shadow. The Earth comes between the moon and the sun. So normally, the sun's light, is, let's think of, is sort of coming over our shoulder and lighting up the face of the full moon. But if we're right in the middle, we're casting a shadow. So the moon might be right in the middle of that shadow, or it could be on the edges of that shadow. So there is such a thing as a sort of partial lunar eclipse. And when it comes to, if it's a total one, when it comes to its moment of totality, the moon is still there in the sky. It is not totally blocked. But it is so shadowed that it has that orangey color that it looks like when we first see a full moon rising. And it looks so yellowy orange. That has to do with the refraction of the sun's light that's coming off of the moon to us and it blocks out the blues and it leaves the reds and that's what they call the blood moon when it's a full moon eclipse and has that reddish color so if it's a lunar eclipse it can be visible from a wide swath across the earth because wherever it's nighttime you're going to see the full moon and it's being eclipsed at certain hours you know um, what happens, it's so interesting because it starts off looking like a total full moon. And then it decreases over the course of some hours, decreases in size, decreases in size, down to where it's going to look like there's just that ruddish color. And then when it starts coming back, it increases from the light comes back from the other side till it comes all the way back to fullness. And oftentimes it's like four hours, and it's a wonderful thing to watch. And it kind of mocks the entire month's lunar cycle. And like I say, it's visible in almost half the Earth. A solar eclipse, on the other hand, is only visible in a precise path. And it won't be coming back to that place on Earth for some time. So you don't see a lot of them. If you just lived in one place and didn't travel, there might be two, three total solar eclipses in your lifetime if you live fairly long. So that's pretty interesting. The um, two types of eclipses, or two repeating cycles, let's talk about that. So one of them is really easy to spot by looking at the degrees and signs where the planets occur. If you're looking through a list or through one of those books called an ephemeris, which is like a table of where all the planets are at any particular day. And those repeat 
every 19 years. But there will only be like three of them up to maybe five of them that will be eclipses. Now you could have other full moons or new moons, whichever the case is, that are 19 years before or after this repeating of the degree, but they're not eclipses. So it's sort of like, let's say, let's pick a degree, let's say zero cancer, okay? You could have full moons at zero cancer, let's say new moons, because I know we have one coming in 2020. So you could have new moons at zero cancer every 19 years-ish, or close to that zero cancer. But maybe there'll be three of those years that are going to be eclipses. And maybe that won't happen again for, I don't know, hundreds or something of years. I, I didn't um, research that. That kind of repetition is called a metonic cycle, M-E-T-O-N-I-C, like tonic with me, or me too with Nick, metonic, named for, I don't know, somebody in Greece who discovered the repeating cycle, maybe his name was Metos or Meton or, you know, something like that. The other kind of cycle is more interesting, although the metonic is great. When you find an eclipse hitting your chart, that means you want to go think back about 19 years or 38 years. What was happening in your life might bear some resemblance to what's going to go on with this eclipse. The other kind of cycle is impossible to spot by looking in a table or an ephemeris. Well, a table of eclipses, unless it's a table that shows this phenomenon. And the phenomenon is called the Saros. S-A-R-O-S series. And this one is mind-blowing. I mean, I think, and I've said this before on looking up, the phenomenon of eclipses is one of the things that really makes me think there is some kind of a grand scheme of things or some cosmic clock watch maker put all of this into motion. Maybe, you know, there is some kind of a god. It's almost like, to me, proof of a god. The Saros cycle is a cycle of about 1260 years containing about 70, 71 eclipses in its series. And it starts the series at either the North Pole or the South Pole. So let's say it starts at the North. After 18 years, the next eclipse is 120 degrees or a third of the 360 degrees of the Earth west of the first series and a little bit closer to the equator and then 18 years 120 degrees west and 18 years 120 degrees west it makes a spiral and it spirals down around the equator and then it spirals more and spirals more until it comes down to the opposite pole so at the beginning and end of the series when it's near the polar areas those can only be partial solar eclipses. When it's around the equator, they will always be total solar eclipses. And we only really look at the solar eclipses in the Saros cycle. So the Saros cycle has numbers. And there's a set of numbers for north and a set of numbers for south. And I believe that probably means if it started at the north pole of the Earth, or started at the south pole of the Earth, and it's aiming towards the other one. And you can look up in a book, like the best one that I know of, is this one called Predictive Astrology, The Eagle and the Lark, by Bernadette Brady, who is British and brilliant. And this is a great book on using different predictive techniques in astrology, but she goes in depth into the Saros cycles, and she has a table where you can look up by the year, the month, the date, as to what is the series number that an eclipse is in. So a little later in the program, I hope we'll have time, we're going to look up the solar eclipses of 2020 and talk about the Saros series that they're in. Each series begins with a particular eclipse. And whatever is the nature of the planetary configurations at that eclipse kind of 
lends a little bit of a flavor to what happens at each subsequent eclipse around that spiral in that series. So it might have been an eclipse in the 1200s that's now going to have an impact on something that's happening in 2020. So one of the most interesting things to do with eclipses is to look in one of those ephemeris books or contact an astrologer or maybe you can find information online because uh, Wikipedia, believe it or not, has very good stuff on eclipses. NASA has very good stuff on eclipses, you know, NASA, the government organization, and a website called Time and Date, timeanddate.com, also has good information on eclipses. Prior to your birth, sometime in the six months while you were still in the womb, there was a solar eclipse. It's called your prenatal eclipse, and that's one you would like to look up in Bernadette's list and see what was the flavor or nature of the Seros series number that that eclipse was. Especially if you have a planet in your birth chart that's within about five degrees of that eclipse. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second because I don't want to forget to tell you that eclipses can only happen when a new moon or a full moon is near what's called the north or south nodes, the nodal axis. They're called the nodes of the moon. And what this is, and we've talked about this before on looking up, there is the orbit of the earth and around the sun. And while the earth's going around the sun, the moon's going around the earth. And actually it's tilted to the earth's orbit by about five degrees. So there's a point in each month where the moon crosses the sun-earth orbit and goes above it. And then another point, about half a month away, where the moon crosses the sun-earth orbit and goes below that orbit. And these are the intersections of those two orbits, and that's what's called the nodes, N-O-D-E-S. So the north node is where the moon goes north of the earth-sun orbit, and the south node it goes south. So if you have a newer full moon within about 19 degrees, but the closer the better, of that node axis, north node or south node, that full moon or new moon will be an eclipse. And when it's further, it's more likely to be one of those partial eclipses. So for instance, we have in 2020, a series of three eclipses during the summer. There's a full moon eclipse, then a new moon eclipse, then a full moon eclipse, spring into summer. Those two lunar ones on either side of the solar one are near the edges of what could be the eclipse range. And the middle one is more closer to being important and exact. It's not still a total eclipse. Okay, so we want to come back to this idea of if you have a birth planet within about five degrees of that eclipse that occurred before you were born, that planet always plays a very important role for you in changes that come about in your life or in your maybe emotional growth and development, things like that. And you want to see, is it nearer the south node or the north node? Uh, and was that eclipse that occurred before your birth a south node eclipse or a north node eclipse? So here's the different flavor of those nodes. The north node is what we say, what you're growing towards in this lifetime. It's what you need to develop. And by its sign and its house in your birth chart, it will give you clues as to what it is you should be doing. But it's not what comes easy. It's not what comes naturally. It's what you have to grow towards. The south node is like what you brought in with you. If you believe in past lives, you might say it represents qualities you had in a past life. But it's something like been there, done that. It's not your growth area. And it's actually what you kind of need to shed and release unless you're going to use it as a springboard to what you need to grow towards with your north node. So for instance, when I looked mine up, it said, um, 
it was a south node eclipse very close to my Pluto and Pluto is already a planet about letting go and you know, getting rid of the garbage and that particular eclipse had a lot to do with I think it was loss and separation yes okay so and sadness at the separation so I usually like blame my Pisces moon that I am a big crier and but especially I mean people I don't even know when they die I cry I, I'll hear something on the news and it might be somebody famous that I never cared about anyway but I'm um, boo hoo hoo and and Pluto is actually the planet that relates to death too so I thought that was pretty funny when I looked up my prenatal um, eclipse and the Pluto connection with that so let's talk about frequency of eclipses so eclipses happen near the nodes the nodes are six signs apart so when new moons or full moons come close to either the north or south node you're going to have eclipses so that means there's kind of two eclipse seasons per annual cycle generally you have two eclipses a new and a full or a full and a new they can happen in either order every once in a while you get the trio like we're going to have this summer and it could be new full new or it could be full new full we're having full new full because of the sort of vagaries of the man-made annual calendar we have a pair of eclipses with one in December of 2019 one in January of 2020 so that's the first eclipse of 2020 in January and I know we talked a lot about that in the show that's 2020 vision from December of 2019 then in the summer we have the three and when fall comes along we're going to have two more that are in calendar year 2020 one of them's on November 30th one of them's on the 14th of December and they'll always be a couple weeks apart just like new and full moons are always a couple weeks apart so that's how we have six eclipses in 2020 very rare when I was looking at some of these books about eclipses they were going oh yeah you might have five in a year well this we got six and this is another great book on eclipses Carl Robert Carl Jansky interpreting the eclipses it has a beautiful photograph on the cover of a total solar eclipse and he's the one that really is into allowing that five degree range or called orb on either side of a natal planet you might be looking at or maybe even a planet that's part of the eclipse chart I like to I'm kind of stingy with my orbs I like things precise but you know an eclipse is a big thing so it, like you don't have too many of them in your lifetime either that hit right on you know a particular part of your chart so I think it's okay to go for five so um, you can also think in terms of the pair of signs where the nodes are moving through called transiting are going to be where the eclipses are occurring possibly on the edges of that into a, the sign before or after and the nodes shift backwards through the zodiac over the course of time spending about a year and a half or so in each pair of signs and after about nine years they've worked their way around so that where the north node was at one point nine years later the south node is there and the north nodes opposite to that so you might also look at say a year's worth of eclipses and think okay even if none of them are hitting exactly at a point in my fourth house let's just say but two or three of those eclipses are in the fourth house it's like wow so that's an important fourth house year for you and you would say whatever fourth house means it's going to be something you're paying a lot of attention to at this point in time and my chart that happens to be home residence things like that um, and the opposite house also receives eclipses and that would be opposite of four is ten so for instance again this coming year in my chart I get eclipses in the 10th house which is career matters 
So I might find that I have some changes or big changes coming in something about where do I live or am I thinking about moving? Am I doing something new with my career? And yeah, we'll see what plays out in 2020. So speaking of 2020, let's just quickly speak for a moment. Our first one on the 10th of January will be visible. It's a lunar eclipse, Asia, Australia, Africa, Europe, Greenland, and the Aleutian Islands. We're not even going to see that one. And that one's big and important because it has a lot of stuff going on in Capricorn, and we talked about that one. The next one is going to be also a lunar eclipse on the 5th of June, and that one will be visible in Africa, the southern part, Indonesia, and Australia. So we're not seeing that one either, but it has a pretty strong connection with uh, a Mars-Neptune thing, which could mean battling about belief systems like religious wars. Neptune also is the planet of oil, and so it's making a T-square with the sun and moon. Not so great. Okay, then we have the most, possibly most important one, on the zero cancer, on the summer solstice, June 21st. That one's a solar eclipse. It will be visible in Africa, going through like what's called the Straits of Hormuz, kind of near the Emirates. It, it's where all the oil problems back up and have trouble, going over into the north part of India, the south part of China. And I just want to tell you, if you are a history book, you would love to get this book, Bill Meridian, The Predictive Power of Eclipse Paths. And he works a lot with um, Charles Jane, J-A-Y-N-E, was a big astrologer in the 20th century and one of Bill's teachers. Big study of World War II, different battles, where things were happening related to different eclipses. And that war went on for a while, so there were several eclipses going on. And one of them, for instance, it was uh, Midheaven, IC Axis. The bottom at the IC, the fourth house cusp, means in this place. And Midheaven is something that has a very public visibility. And that's what was happening in Pearl Harbor before we had the attack on the U.S. there. So check out the eclipse paths. The next eclipse, the lunar eclipse on almost really our birthday, July 4th, 5th, in Washington. It's going to be visible in America, all of North America, all of South America. That one is giant for us because things are going to be happening in our country in a big way in 2020. And that's how we know is because of this full moon eclipse at our birthday. Then we have the another full moon eclipse end of November. It's again North and South America, somewhat of Asia, somewhat of Australia. Mm, that one doesn't have really bad aspects. And then the total solar eclipse of the 14th of December and that one Ooh, I didn't write down where it was visible. Not here. Again, I think it's Asia, Africa, something like that. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to look at eclipse paths. Go to something like the Time and Date or Wikipedia or NASA site. Look those up. Check out the ones that are hitting your chart within five degrees. Let something go if it's a south node. Go towards it if it's a north node. I can't believe we ran out of time already because it's fun looking at eclipses. See you again soon on Looking Up.